Pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Boone, the keynote speaker of the 2013 African Conference. Dr. Boone is Professor of Government and Fellow of the Long Chair in Democratic Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. She specializes in comparative politics with an emphasis on theories of political economy and economic development. She has conducted research on industrial, commercial, and land tenure policies in West Africa, where her work has been funded by the Social Science Research Council, the Fulbright, the World Bank, and the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies. An academic of repute, Professor Boone has served as member of the Board of Directors of the African Studies Association, AISA, 2009-2012 session, and chair of the Publications Committee of the AISA, 2011-2012 trench. She was member of the Executive Council of the American Political Science Association, and twice member of the Executive Committee of the Comparative Politics Section of APSA, as well as a member of review boards for the National Science Foundation, the Fulbright, and the Social Science Research Council, SSRC. Dr. Boone was a member of the Africa Regional Advisory Panel of the SSRC, Secretary of the African Politics Conference Group, and APSC Affiliated Research Network, and is member of the Coordinating Committee for the APSC African In Initiative, which runs training workshops for African scholars in Africa. Professor Boone was treasurer and president of the West African Research Association 2005 to 2008, which oversees the West African Research Center in Dakar, Senegal, and its national program, co-chair of the APSA 2013. Dr. Boone is an award-winning scholar. She is the author of Merchant Capital and the Roots of the State Power in Senegal, 1930 to 1985, which was published by Cambridge in 1992. She was a finalist for the Herskovic Award in 1993 and Political Topographies of the African States, Rural Authority and Institutional Choice, also published by Cambridge in 2003. She was a finalist for the Herskovic Award in 2004 a runner-up for the Lubert Award in 2004, and winner for the, of the Society for Comparative Research, Matei Dogan Award in 2005. In 2013, uh, she uh, published Property and Political Order, Land Rights, and the Structure of Politics of Africa. Uh, well, this will be published by Carolina uh, University Press in 2013. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming to the podium this wonderful scholar, Dr. Boone. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Very generous. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Happy to welcome you all to Austin. Happy to thank Professor Toyin Falola for inviting me to give this keynote. And looking forward very much to the panels tomorrow. Um, so welcome. My job is to address the conference theme politics, uh, expressive politics, mobilization, religion, um, and related issues, and to talk about those themes as they relate to my own research. And as I was preparing, actually after I basically prepared my comments, I thought about how to present this to you tonight. And I started to prepare a PowerPoint and then uh, I started to prepare an outline, maybe an outline to be put up on the PowerPoint. 
And then I started imagining the context with the full day of panels and then the barbecue, uh, uh, the barbecue dinner and the people from out of town thinking about what they're going to be doing tonight at the Holiday Inn or on 6th Street. And I realized that those uh, kind of visual aids might ask too much, really, of the listeners. So I decided to go only with this beautiful map and to allow you to just uh, tune in and out of this talk, you know, at your own pace, to can kind of wash over you, uh, as, wash over you as, as you listen. So the theme, political expression and mobilization. As a political scientist, these parts of the conference theme are very close to what I do and to my disciplinary preoccupations. And I thought I would use these comments tonight to um, speak to the theme from the perspective of my discipline, but also to criticize political science a little bit, being open, of course, to your rebuttals and um, pushback in the end. Um, I think that political science, when it studies, or let's say Anglophone political science, especially in the United States, when it studies politics in Africa today, it's really missing the big picture. Really missing the big picture. And so what I'd like to do tonight, using political science, my discipline, which has nursed me and protected me for 25 years, using my discipline as a foil, use the example of land politics to talk about some of the really big political issues and big forms of political mobilization that I think my discipline is missing. Um, so use land, po land politics, my area of research now, to talk about political mobilization and to talk about the stakes of politics in African countries in a way that breaks with the predominant discourses in political science. So it's going to be a three-part talk. This is where you get the verbal rendering of the outline that I decided not to put up on the PowerPoint. A three-part talk. So first, let me just talk very generally about land politics and political science. In the second section, I would like to talk about forms of land-related politics. So what people, what we can see or talk about when we say land politics and some of the drivers of land politics in Sub-Saharan Africa today. And then in part three, talk about some of the, what I call constitutional matters at stake in the land policy domain. And I know that everybody here who has ever set foot in Sub-Saharan Africa, not to mention being from there or raised there, has knowledge and, uh, let's say, strong knowledge and strong, strong information and strong views on land politics. And so I don't want to talk too long uh, so that there's time for engagement. So the first part is uh, the anecdotal part. So as I was writing these words a few weeks ago, I was watching the election returns from Kenya. There's no country in Sub-Saharan Africa today in which land politics has been more central over the course of the last century. Land politics is central to the national trajectory. Kenya is a country of massive land expropriation under the British, as you know. It is a country that was marked by a very bitter transition to independence that centered on a guerrilla struggle motivated in large part by land politics. It was a country with a constitution in the early 1960s that was forged around bitter and very divisive struggles around land. And it is a country that, since the return to multipartyism in 1992, has seen waves of land-related conflict at almost each election, waves of land-related violence in 92, 97, 2007, and more recently, but in a more attenuated way in 2013. So in Kenya, land issues are bound up with every aspect of national politics and really virtually every moment of the national trajectory. And many issues are bound together in the land struggles in Kenya. There are issues of restitution uh, that invoke historical justices and injustices. There are landlord stranger issues in Kenya that raise the question of who has rights and 
entitlements to land, ancestral title entitlements, and how those are weighed against modern leases and land purchases and title deeds. There are questions about ethnicity and the claims to ethnic homelands that are bound up in land politics. And there's the question of the formation of a new post-colonial political elite of wealthy people that epitomize a growing gap between rich and poor in Kenya. The Kenyatta, Moy, and Kabaki families, the leading presidential political families in Kenya, are the lar largest landowners in Kenya today. So Kenya is a country that has been a political history written from A to Z, largely around land. And now let me give my critique of political science. The political science literature focuses a lot on Kenya and on parties and elections in Kenya because we have a lot of data in Kenya and Kenya is an Anglophone country, it makes it very easy for people in the US. Um, and Kenya has had dramatic and bitterly contested elections. But if you read the political science literature on Kenya, especially the literature focusing on parties and elections in the current period, what you'll find out is that Kenyan politics lack programmatic content, that there are no real issues, that the politics is candidate-centered, that the parties are weak and not advocating real agendas for change. So the political scientists notice that in their public opinion polls, people are not talking about big political issues, at least in response to the questions that are asked. They analyze the official party platforms and they don't see anything. There's nothing about, there's rarely anything directly about land. And there's not much that many in political science would recognize as a left-right divide in those party platforms. So they don't see the functional equivalent of Democrats and Republicans or the functional equivalent of left-right parties in European politics. Um, they don't see people evaluating the performance of the past government you know, whether the past government reduced uh, inflation or reduced unemployment or not. And so the political scientists often conclude that elections in Kenya are not programmatic and ideological. People are voting on the basis of ethnicity. Um, and the, the elections are candidate-centered. And so then the political scientists ask, where, where's the politics in these elections? Um, so as you can anticipate, I would like to say that this lens that's being used to analyze party politics in Kenya is, you know, for reasons maybe we can talk about later, is making the substantive political issues in Kenya disappear. I mean, people aren't really seeing the deep, high stakes issues that are animating politics or animating the way people think about state society relations in Kenya. Is a kind of hollowing out or diverting attention away from some of the really big issues of politics that I think are at play in every Kenyan election, especially and including those we've had since 1992, and big issues that are really constitutional issues about very fundamental issues about how the society should be set up, what is the structure of the state, what is the relationship between the individual and the community. These are the issues I think people are struggling over in Kenya and they're all very starkly manifest in the domain of land politics, and sometimes directly animated by land politics. So that's what I would like to talk about today, but I don't want to stick only on the issue of Kenya, although if we have time in the end, I'll return to it. What I would like to do now, and now we're, in the, on, we're on part two of our outline, is talk about land-related politics more generally, so sort of abstract from the Kenya case, and to talk about some patterns of land politics that people see when they sort of look across the continent today, and what we would be referring to when we created a category, a, a category of politics called land-related politics, and then talk about why I think land politics has become so acute and prominent in so many African countries in the last 10 years or so. So forms of land-related conflict. Many of you study or are aware of the phenomenon of farmer-herder farmer conflict. So many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa where the grazing lands abut the lands of 
settled agriculture, grazers and herders are being pushed more and more into the zones of the settled farmers. And settled farmers under the pressure of population stress or climate or search for new lands are pushing into the zones of herders. So there's farmer-herder conflict that is very stark across much of the Sahelian zone or the savanna that runs from east to west across the, the continent, farmer-herder conflict. We talked a lot about this in the case of Darfur um, in the, the Darfur wars recently. There's landlord-stranger conflict in many, many countries and many places. Landlord-stranger conflict where people who claim that the land that's being farmed is their ancestral land find themselves at odds with strangers or incomers or newcomers, people who came from elsewhere, who uh, then uh, dispute control and claims over land. We have conflict around land that involves chiefly authority. Of course, as you know, chiefs are not important in land politics in many, many places in Sub-Saharan Africa, but in some places they are very important. And the questions about how chiefs allocate land or resolve land disputes or field uh, offers to sell land in uh, different communities have become a very, very important and politically charged arena of land-related struggle in many places, many, country, many places in many countries. There is a land politics that revolves around demarcation of jurisdictions. So drawing lines on maps and saying which boundaries separate who from whom and which boundaries place which territory under whose authority. One interesting current case is the case of demarcation politics in South Sudan. And uh, I have a young colleague who wrote an article about demarcation politics in Juba. So Juba, as you know, is, to, is the national capital of the new country of South Sudan. The Sudanese, South Sudanese authorities want to create a, federal, a, a national capital territory around Juba to excise that land from the, the sort of customary jurisdictions in that area and excise that land from the uh, formal political authority of the uh, government of Central Equatoria State. So it's a land dispute about which kind of government has, which, which government, which layer of government, and which kind of government really has authority over this territory. And then, of course, I mean, we could stay here all night if we wanted to talk about land politics that center on the restitution, questions of restitution of lands ill-gotten or illegitimately assigned. So it's very easy to see those land politics when we talk about land ill-gotten or expropriated or illegitimately assigned in the colonial era. So that's part of the Kenya story that I invoked a minute ago. But I would say now in most countries we have very bitter fights over restitution, fights that are about the possibility of restitution of lands that have been taken by post-colonial governments for allocation to other people in settlement schemes for allocation as private property holdings by foreigners or, you know, big people within countries, um, lands allocated as forest land and therefore under the direct authority of the central state, lands allocated for national parks, lands taken for urban jurisdictions as is the case of uh, Juba, etc. So these are all different forms of land politics that you know, manifest themselves in many different arenas in many different ways. Usually in, you know, usually in peaceful conflict with people, you know, arguing and debating, sometimes in the political arena, sometimes not, sometimes within families or amongst neighbors, but sometimes exploding into very divisive, violent conflicts. And there's a large literature on the role of land conflicts in motivating some of the civil wars that have uh, afflicted the continent in the last 20 years or so. So Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, northern Uganda, Darfur, South Sudan, eastern DRC, Rwanda, Burundi, the list is very long. So there's a lot of land conflict. 
There's also a lot of land law reform being discussed in many African countries. I think within the last 10 countries, almost half of all the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa have embarked on some kind of national level process initiated by the central government aimed at land law reform. So some countries have passed laws or tried to pass laws. Some countries have set up national commissions uh, to consider land law and land law reform. Some countries have had these traveling popular fora and mobilizations where the authorities go around the country and meet with regular people to talk to them about land and land law and how it can be uh, revised or improved. Uh, some countries like Kenya have written new land law into new constitutions. So a lot of land law discussion and reform at different levels of the political, different levels of the political system and in different forms. I think there are many different drivers of this process, but let me mention a few. This is sort of interesting to consider their heterogeneity. One is the World Bank. As part of second generation structural adjustment programs, the World Bank urged African governments to undertake land law reform, sort of deep reform of the institutional structures governing the allocation of this all important asset. A second driver of this land uh, law reform movement, if you want, is electoral politics. Uh, so with the opening of politics to multi-partyism, many constituencies have emerged to demand restitution or to try to hook up with politicians who would advance their land agenda or land domains. It is the emergence of new outside political leaders and representatives in the multi-party era people who are seeking to voice often, you know, what are sometimes long repressed demands that are often about land. Um, and there are the wars also that uh, drive, a, that emerge sometimes partially out of land politics, but also then force land politics uh, debates or land law reform in the wake of, in the wake of post-conflict, often in, around the problem of resettlement of displaced populations. So you know, for example, in Rwanda after 2004, as the RPF took power, almost 100,000 people immigrated back into eastern Rwanda, all of whom had to be, um, had to be resettled. And then fourthly, of course, there is a climate change and demographic increase. So climate change forces people to change the way they farm or where they farm to move to cope with uncertainty in new ways. A demographic increase is a factor too because people search for new land. And it's especially a factor because other parts of the economy are not generating off-farm livelihoods at a rate that would draw people, draw all these new entrants into the workforce directly out of agriculture. So there are a lot of factors that push land onto the political agenda and generate pressures around land. So the mobilization around the land commissions and the constitutional referenda and some of the electoral politics uh, that center on land or touch on land are the mobilizations that I wanted to invoke tonight uh, in this conference that has its political mobilizations and political expression and religion as, uh, as its central theme. And so what I would like to do uh, now in this last part of the talk is to uh, flag or sketch out the constitutional issues that I see as wrapped up in these land questions. So very basic issues about the setup of government and state society relations. So these constitutional issues, and uh, I'll break them into three, three different issues as it were, and then give you some short examples, uh, which I hope, I hope I'll try to make it short. Um, constitutional issues. So I think there are three that we could talk about right, right here, although you, may, you can probably add to this. The first issue is about the scope and limits of private property and the market. Really, it's about uh, the possibility and desirability of market economies that are built on the commodification of land. 
private property as an institution and the legitimacy of private property is one huge constitutional issue at stake in these debates. A second huge issue is this issue about the locus of authority to allocate. The locus of allocative authority and of political sovereignty. So who has the right to decide where to draw these boundaries, how to run these territories, and how to allocate the precious asset, if you will, the precious resource that is land. That's a question about state authority and the character of the authority of the state and about state structure, how different levels of authority are nested into a larger political system. So that's the second kind of constitutional issue that is at stake in land politics. And then thirdly is the constitutional issue of citizenship. And you know, in particular, the possibility, the desirability, and the limits of national citizenship very intimately intertwined in these land questions. So intimately intertwined in the land questions, the stake in all three arenas is very high for the future of African countries, African economies, for livelihoods, for how people live and how they relate to their government. And I think that, and you can confirm or disconfirm or check this against what you know, I think if people, you know, regular people in African countries, uh, let's say land holders or land users, I think they understand these issues very well. I think they're acutely aware of, of the questions that are raised in land politics. So the first uh, point about private property in the market, if I can say a little bit about that. So the question here is, would it be good for government to endorse the move toward private property in land throughout zones of smallholder production? So zones of smallholder production, you know, are family farms, what, you know, some we used to call peasant farms, or smallholder farms where pe the families farm the land partially for subsistence and, and partially, and per, you know, often selling some of their output on the market. Do we want private property in these zones? Um, as you know now, family structure and community structure is often embedded in the land, in land ownership and land allocation. So in most places, people believe and local political and institutional structure supports the idea that somehow the land in, these, in a given territory is somehow land for that community. So private property offers a radically different model of individualized holdings or holdings within nuclear families where families or property holders have uh, the ability and the authority to fully transact these lands on the market. They can sell to anyone they want. They don't have to consult anyone in the community. They can sell to people outside the community. These parcels can be, under a private property regime, the parcels can be divided up and sold off to anyone under the authority only of the, of the user. So the extended families and the communities lose any claim or attachment to land. They're, rooted in land no more. You know that there are active informal markets in many farming regions of most of Sub-Saharan Africa and active markets for sale and rental. So people are out there doing market transactions in land and so we're part of the way toward markets anyway. So the issue that is a burning one in so many places right now, and that is a constitutional, invokes constitutional issues, but is also often very divisive, is whether land sales are final. So when you sell land to someone, is that a final sale? Or is it more like a loan, or more like a, a lease, or like a rental? And I can give you an example of a situation in which this is very divisive. It's a case I know very well from southwestern Cote d'Ivoire, in the starting in the 1950s going up is a drama that continues to the present. So in southwestern Cote d'Ivoire, the national government encouraged 
people from outside the southwest, or if you're really into Cote d'Ivoire <laughs> political geography, we would maybe call the center west, but southern part of the country, southwest, the, the government encouraged people who live in this area to welcome in, in migrants who could expand the farming frontier. And the deals uh, that surrounded this welcoming in was that these in-migrants were supposed to make payments to the people who were already in place, the indigenous inhabitants. So when land was abundant, the people who you know, had been there for a long time, they weren't always super happy about it, but they accepted money in exchange for letting these in-migrants use land. Sometimes it was good because they wanted the money. The problem was that over time, land became scarce, tensions arose, and the people who were you know, claiming this as their ancestral area didn't want these strangers here anymore. Uh, so in the 1990s, the legitimacy of these early, trans early transfers, or even the meaning of these transfers, became a matter of heated and painful dispute. Two things fired up the dispute. First was officially endorsed programs of land titling and registration. So under the support of the foreign donors, as they call them, in this case the French, under the, with the encouragement and backing of the French, the government embarked on a land registration and titling program in this region where uh, people were supposed to go around and you know, just demarcate the properties and say who owned them. So when these people showed up and asked, well, who owns this land, really? The debates and tensions between the in-migrants and the indigenous people flared up. The other thing that poured oil on these simmering, you know, oil on the fire was the death of the long-standing president, Hufoy Boigny, and the heating, up multi uh, heating up of multi-party politics. So the candidates that emerged to campaign in this region took opposing sides in the land dispute. One party lined up with the indigenous people with their ancestral claims, and the other party lined up with the settlers. So the question before the courts, as it were, the question that ended up in the political arena was this question of redemption and whether these sales were final, whether the land sales were final. The stranger said, we paid for the land, we gave the money, we even have a piece of paper these people signed, this is our land, and these ancestral claims have been, you know, extinguished, ex extinguished and sold off. And the people who had always lived there said, well, no, there was surely been a misunderstanding because we would never sell our ancestral land. So it's a question about whether this is really transactable private property, a commodity on the market. And the government has been asked to uh, take a stand on that issue. The government, it is the government that will come in and enforce property claims or enforce the ancestral entitlements. It's very divisive. And among other things, it also pits the people with money to buy against those who hold land on the basis of their birthright, who don't have money to buy. They have their ancestral claim. And so questions about rich and poor and class formation also immediately become wrapped up in, the, uh, wrapped up in these debates about private property and about the right of redemption uh, that is completely, uh, you know, driving very bitter conflict in this area. And as you know, the Ivoirians also have suffered a long, a bitter war and a long a period of division of their country, occupation by foreign forces, lasting for almost a decade. But this land issue was very central and remains so in Ivoirian politics. So that's an issue about the legitimacy of private property that the government needs to take a stand on, the bitterly divisive. A second example, or let's turn to this question about the structure of the government and the locus of allocative decisions and sovereignty. It's a different kind of constitutional issue, and I can give you an example here too. So this is a question of who has the authority to allocate land within a given uh, subnational jurisdiction? Who has the authority to allocate land? And in some places in sub-Saharan Africa, chiefs, some kind of chief or somebody with, you know, claiming ancestral customary authority, claims the authority to allocate land. 
And that land allocation is just part and parcel of a whole political structure wherein chiefly authority is recognized as a form of government authority at the local level. Uh, so chiefly authority as an embodiment of the jurisdiction of the community and a kind of sovereignty of the community over land and in some areas at the subnational level. So when people start fighting about the authority of chiefs to give and take land, what they're really <laughs> arguing about is the authority of chiefs per se. And they're arguing about these local chieftaincies and about whether this subnational form of government that's kind of tucked into the national institutional structure is one that should be preserved. So the example that I can give you that is the pretty, you know, an ex kind of extreme example, but it's very clear cut, is in Kumasi in Ghana. So you know that Ghana has some of the strongest and best institutionalized colonial and post-colonial chieftaincies in, in West Africa. And in Kumasi, uh, the, the Asante Haney, the, the head of the Asante the people, has authority over land within the municipal jurisdiction that has, you know, under kind of a treaty been ceded to the national government. But these uh, political authorities in, and the chiefs of uh, Kumasi argue that when the town stretches out through urban sprawl, to touch the land of farmers, that land that the farmers are using then reverts to the chieftaincy. So your farm may be three miles out away from the center of Kumasi, but you know, the roads are paved, there's more traffic, every, people have cars, there's urban sprawl, there are investors, and so the town is spreading. And so the chiefs of Kumasi say that when the edge of the town reaches your farm, your farm then reverts to the chieftaincy. And so this is supposed to be, you know, the underpinning of chiefly authority. The problem is the people who have these farms, you know, they may have 100 acres of cocoa. It's a very valuable asset. You know, sometimes people also use some of their land commercially, but it's just an outright expropriation. And so some people, you know, some people say, well, okay, I'm loyal to the chieftaincy. I will give back my land. Well, they might not like it, but some people fight it and take it to the national government and say, hey, it's, you know, it's 2013, we're in the modern world, I own this land, this is my asset, I don't want to give it up to somebody, you know, claiming neo-traditional authority. So it creates a kind of constitutional crisis, sort of a mini constitutional crisis, because the question is, who are these chiefs? Who do they represent? What can they buy? What can they take? Who do they control? You know, the entire, you know, what's the expression? You know, the entire kit and caboodle is opened up through by this land land question. And you know, this is a political issue that people in this country need to deal with. And then finally, the question of national citizenship. Um, the question of whether, as the Kenyans say, and I'll talk about the case of Kenya to illustrate this. Do Kenyans have the right to live anywhere within their country? Are Kenyans allowed to live anywhere within the national space or not? So this question is asking whether a citizen of Kenya can go anywhere and enter a land market and set up a business anywhere within Kenya. So, you know, one answer could be yes. The fact of the matter is that in Kenya, there is a strong, there are strong ethnic homeland jurisdictions where people, you know, many people feel that subnational territory should be reserved for people that are indigenous to that, that territory. So these are ethnic territories that were demarcated under colonial rule, boundaries were drawn under colonial rule, but uh, you know, those people usually were there, bef were there before. And people who say, okay, this is a district, this is for the Kisi people, you have to be in the Kisi ethnic group to, to buy land and live and be a permanent full resident of this territory. So the question of national citizenship or local citizenship, so this is tearing 
Kenya apart because in the settlement scheme, in many, in many ways, but most dramatically, in the settlement schemes of the Rift Valley, where lands that had been expropriated by the British were then assumed by the post-colonial government of Kenya, and the post-colonial government of Kenya then brought in people from heavily populated agricultural regions to settle the rift. So a big debate in Kenya is whether those people really have the right to be in the rift valley, or whether those rift valley properties or lands, holdings, parcels, should revert to people with ancestral claims. So this issue um, was a central driver of conflict over the new constitution of Kenya. There was a national land policy that has, there is a national land policy that has divided the country for 10 years fighting over this issue. Kenya passed the new constitution, but the constitution actually passed because it embraced both positions in a contradictory way, completely kicking the question down the road to be resolved by Kenya somehow, somehow, parliament on the local level, under the new constitution, the courts, we don't know, but it surely will infuse all domains of politics. So there are th three kinds of constitutional issues and three examples. So in conclusion, so I would say in the domain of land politics, we see these very fundamental political issues rear, rear up directly in the everyday, daily, intimate politics of families and communities and livelihoods in ways that are pressing and acute. Sometimes in the electoral arena, as in the cases of Cote d'Ivoire and Kenya and in many others that we could talk about, but sometimes in, in, in other ways, often ways that don't make it onto the radar screen even of most political scientists unless it breaks out into war. But even in the electoral arena, candidates and parties do campaign in ways that uh, trigger or tap into these issues, even though it might not be obvious on the surface of things when they uh, sketch out their formal party platforms. You know, people say that the election is only about ethnicity, but actually ethnicity is entangled in all these questions in different ways, in these very fundamental constitutional questions. So I think the political scientists are completely wrong, I mean completely wrong, 180 degrees wrong when they say they don't see the programmatic political issues. I think in a way there are too many programmatic and political issues and the stakes are, the stakes are so high that the elections actually become so decisive that the divisions can be very, very deep. And it's kind of interesting to contrast what countries are facing with what we you know, may remember from the political history of the US or the UK. In the US and the UK, just to take two examples, many of these very basic constitutional issues about state structure and, how, and the, the mechanisms, at least, for defining citizenship, um, questions about sovereignty, were decided before mass enfranchisement. So you have a small elite sort of drafting and constructing constitutions that are then in place when the political system's open to mass electoral politics. Even though, of course, you know, in the US, of course, we have ongoing tinkering with our constitution. It has to be, you know, it is improved, hopefully, over time. There are, it's not fixed at a given moment, but you have the basic structures in place. In many African countries, we see a very different process where these hugely fundamental constitutional questions are on the political agenda at the time of elections. There's a complete inversion of the process, a complete inversion of the process to the point where the stakes in elections sometimes are so high and so acute for so many people that it's very it becomes hard to contain the politics within the electoral process itself. So uh, that, yes, that concludes what I wanted to say about land politics and political mobilization and how it's linked to constitutional issues of very fundamental import. So with that, I, I will stop and 
to hear your responses. And thank you for listening. in this. Let me apologize to some of us who sat on the floor, those who wanted to enter, there was no more space, and this attests to the quality of um, our speaker and the expectation by those who come to listen to it. I would like to take this opportunity to pay respect to Chinua Achebe, if it is possible for you to stand up, do so. If it's not possible, just sit down. Uh, I want us to I would like us to obtain a minute of silence to one of the greatest um, literary figures in the world. Just a moment of silence, please. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Please sit. Uh, let me underscore the importance of um, the great lecture that you have just listened to. And um, I do not know the questions that many of you have in mind, but I just want to underscore it in five or six ways, very quickly. This is not another lecture. That in places like Angola and Nigeria, issue of land and real estate is a new form of um, hiding stolen money. So that you find in the capital of Angola or in Lagos, a piece of land so expensive that you wonder where people get the money from. And part of the reason is that as we began to police stolen money, people in Angola and Nigeria began to say, okay, we'll take our money to China and Dubai, and the rest we'll use to buy land and, and real estate. Uh, so that you find situations in which um, uh, it's not possible for a professor in the U.S. or anybody in Europe to even contemplate buying a piece of land in Lekki, Nigeria. And the sources are stolen money, uh, and they're trying to hide it. That's one example, just to underscore the, the, the great lecture. The other one is the issue of um, Zimbabwe and Mugabe. How Mugabe has been able to prop his government and stay in power because of the politics of land and redistribution in favor of those who support him. Then you have Sudan and Darfur, which he mentioned. And then the crisis in the Chad Basin, which people have not paid attention to, in which that region has been losing a lot of um, water resources and is fueling what is now called Boko Haram that is presented as a religious crisis, but much, much deeper linked to land. So we have two forces from the area of Burkina Faso and Mali, because of their own crisis, they move eastwards. They move eastwards, settling in places like Jaws in large numbers. And as um, Ari Garuba, in a lecture that he gave here, told us, that you can divide states into sovereign states and non-sovereign states, in which countries like Nigeria and others, they are non-sovereign states. They don't, they don't know when you are born. They don't have records of when you are, when you are dead, so that they don't have enormous records, but we, and so that they are unable to connect many of these crises uh, to profound uh, issues on citizenship with a citizen adjustment to land, what is happening to nomadic population that were established in the past that could no longer function, and issues around declining water resources, damage to topsoil, and politics. 
then you have um, two issues. China, grabbing land everywhere. Nigeria, Niger, Chad, in an attempt to provide food for his own population. It, uh, an increasing politics of turning Africa into a land, into, into a food production. So that the record that we used to talk about food crises and things like that is going to change in years ahead as Africa becoming a major food exporter. Exporter to where? To China, in relation to how uh, land is being acquired just before our own very highs. And one final example, uh, Kenyatta's uh, and uh, Kenya and the recent election, which is still being contested. And I was telling someone today that don't wait for those judicial decisions because nobody is going to remove the son of Jomo Kenyatta from power. But it's linked to two fundamental crises that Jomo Kenyatta in power acquired enormous amount of land as president, which his family has consolidated upon. So you have a president, a young man, who is the richest person in his country, tied to internal business, land control, and other things. And how a new elite, in an attempt to make money, has turned the production of flour far more far above the production of food. Kenya, next to the Netherlands, is now one of the biggest suppliers of flour, uh, taking them in, uh, every day to European countries where they find expressions. Let me stop here. We will not be able to take many questions. Maybe we should take a maximum of four. And she's going to respond only at once. So it's not going to be one on one. So if you have a, do you have a notepad, Professor? Just write down the questions so that you just respond only at once. Okay. Yeah. Should I stay here? Yeah, just stay there. Okay. So just write down the questions. I will vacate the. I will vacate. So questions, please. Yes, yes. To Sharp from um, Kansas State University. Yeah, please. Do you want to use this? She's from Uganda. Am I correct? Very, yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes, I'm from Uganda. My name is Tushabe. Um, so I want to turn this question into uh, a way of how we can collaborate together in our research. So I'm not going to make it a critique or anything like that, but I'm going to invite us to think about how we can work together. And I, because land is very, 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 very important. In some places, it's a commodity, but in other places, it's a relation, okay? And we don't have to go to Africa to see that. It's also in the U.S. So we can think about the formation of the U.S. as a nation, as a continent. The Native Americans have a relationship to land. European Americans have a concept of land as a commodity. And the introduction of citizenship in places that have been colonized, land have turned into, have been turned into a commodity that you colonize and get profit off of. Many people in Africa were relocated so that the colonizers can have that land to build their mansions, to own as their own farms, to build the infrastructure. I'm not saying that roads are very bad, but you have to think if everywhere in the world we had to have seven lanes of roads, where would people live? And why do we have famine? And why would we have wars? So this is what I'm, I want us to do. How do we begin colonizing, rather decolonizing, our conceptualization and relationship to land in the US before we go to Africa or Asia or Latin America to think about citizenship and private property. I want to add because I think you understand where I'm going and I want to give other people a chance to ask their questions. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Amina Wallace, and I just wanted to ask why is there such an importance of comparing Africa to Europe? I think that in that way, 
we kind of set ourselves up for failure when we do that. So I just wanted you to talk about that. Two, two more questions, please. Two more. Yes, please. Where are you from? Thank you. Well, I want to appreciate the professor for her erudite presentation. Two questions straight to the point. The first is that your topic, social movements around land claims and land rights in Africa, to my mind is quite an ambitious uh, issue because when you are talking about land, there is the need for us to contextualize the issue of land claims and land rights within various uh, regions. And that, like I said, you have not done. Uh, so if we are to discuss the issue of land claims and land rights, we need to contextualize them. Number one, possibly within countries, for us to be able to discuss it uh, very well. And then secondly, is that possibly this has to do with my discipline. I'm a sociologist. We have listened to your stories about the issues of land rights and land claims. What interests me most or more is what is the way forward. And then thirdly, uh, when I was told that you are in the area of theories of political economy, I was quite glad because I thought I was going to be listening, as it were, to some very basic analysis that has to do with class, that has to do with state, that has to do with colonialism in Africa. Because you need to remember, or you need to note that, to note that in Africa, there are two kinds of colonies. The settler colonies, and that's why you talked so much about Kenya, because Kenya was more of a settler colony than, say, for example, uh, Nigeria, which was just uh, a place for the expropriation of resources, uh, which were carted away to the, to the West. So I think you need to bring the theoretical a framework, which is political economy, to bear. And when I'm talking about the political economy approach, there are two kinds. The bourgeois political economy approach, and what we call the radical, or the Marxist political economy approach. And I want to say that it is the Marxist political economy approach that actually unveils the depths of the issues that has to do with land claims and land rights. I think I rest my case here. Why is this Marxist? Why is this Marxist? We are near bourgeois suit. <laughs> now, uh, yeah. I thought you would be dressed like me. Please, yeah. One last comment. Uh, she's from Kenya. You're from Kenya, right? Yeah. Sorry I talk about Kenya. <laughs> well, mine is, I am from Kenya, and mine is, mine is just to make a comment. Um, like the lady said, uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Louder? Okay, hold on. Yeah, that's better, right? Okay, um, my issue is, again, with how we speak about Kenya, there are a few things that I think were mentioned that are a little bit in, inaccurate. I am a Kenyan, and there is nobody who has a problem buying land anywhere in Kenya. We are people from different tribes, and there are p places that you affiliate yourself with more because that's where you come from. That's your community. That's your home. We have had problems where people have fought about land, and it comes down to the Rift Valley and, um, and how the land was uh, brought in by 
how the British divided the land when they came in. But please do not take it that we are sitting down in Kenya refusing that as Kenyans, anybody can buy land anywhere. We do love each other, even though we do have our tribal preferences, there are things like that that happen. On the other end, when we talk about Kenyatta, and the land that he attained, yes, they did attain land. The story goes deeper than that. It is a deeper story. And as somebody said, um, there was the issue of community and land. People lived on these lands as community. That's why even now when you talk about Kenya and the Kenyatta family, you'll be talking about his family. It's his community. But let's not forget that there are other people in Kenya who are just as wealthy. So when we talk about Kenya, I think it's important also when we're talking about the different countries, like somebody said again, Nigeria is different. Their history is different from Kenya. We're mingling too many things and that's why it becomes a problem. When we look at Kenya and we say that we don't, um, we don't vote on ideologies like the West does with the Democrats or the Conservatives, it's because our issues are different. You know, our issues are slightly different. Just one second and I'll finish. Um, <laughs> no, that's my passion for my home. Um, when, we look at <laughs> when we look at the differences is, um, in Kenya, you're going to have more of socialism. This is something that was brought again during the, uh, uh, the British time, where everybody was sort of given a handout. So we don't have much of the exact capitalism and socialism that you'll have here. But we are people who do look at um, um, how we are voting. The other problem we had is we were ruled by dictators for a while. When we had the Moy presidency, you could not stand against him and take him out of power. So these are things that are changing now. So please don't look at us as though we are just ignorant and we just vote based on tribe. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I would um, make, I will, I would um, conference by, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Please, let me apologize for those who want to ask questions. I really apologize. I want to ask um, conference participant a question. When do we pick you from your hotel tomorrow morning? What? No? No? Hold on, please, please, please. It's not nine. It is 8.15, eight o'clock. Please, please, uh, let, oh, please, please, please. Tomorrow is going to be very intense, extremely intense. So uh, tomorrow is going to start very early and we're going to end at 12 in the night. Uh, so, so it's very intense. Please and bear with us. Uh, please, please, please. You can see that um, the professor has um, given us an important topic, one that um, everyone has an opinion about, a topic that is connected to identity, ethnicity, politics, economy, and sociology, and ideology, and that um, uh, it is one that will continue to attract attention. I want to give her a few minutes to respond. Please come forward. You don't have to respond to all the questions, but just to respond to one or two. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I realize that already we're over time, so. Let me just basically say I agree with everything that was said. Um, I, I do. Um, I agree with everything that um, was said. I agree about the contextualization. I agree that the question about the way forward is the big question. I agree that the different political economy approaches would generate different uh, perspectives on comparing Africa to Europe. I agree that it is uh, often not very fruitful. So that's why I criticize a political scientist who say there's no issues. They're saying that, you know, they're not, the issues are different doesn't mean there are no issues. That would be one of my main points. But, uh, 
you know, maybe we can prevail upon Professor Ferola to use land as a theme for a future meeting because I, it's definitely true that it intersects with all issues and everyone uh, has so much to say about it, but it's very complex and uh, it's super important. So since that is what you all said, I think I'm to the point where everyone agrees with me. So I appreciate that very much. And on that note, I release you to your, to your festivities and celebrations the end of Friday. Thank you.